Good evening, everyone, and you're all very welcome to tonight's webinar, which has been brought to you tonight by the advisory staff here in County Mayo. My name is Brendan Gary. I work in Chagos and Ballinrobe, and tonight, for the next hour, I'm delighted to be your host for this evening. Now, tonight, the focus switches to organic farming, and in recent weeks, a new organic farming scheme was launched by Minister Pippa Hackett, and with rising costs, many farmers are now considering organic farming as a system on their farm. So tonight, we'll have a dedicated hour towards organic farming. Our first speaker tonight will be Seamus Barron, who works in the organic unit in the Department of Agriculture based in Johnstown Castle. And Seamus will give us an overview of the new organic farming scheme. Our later, Chagas organic specialist Joe Kelleher from Chagas Newcastle West will give us some guidelines if you are considering switching to organic farming. And later tonight, John Noonan from Chagas and Westport uh, will have an interactive conversation with Joe Kelly, who is an organic farmer farming near Bell and Joe has been an organic farming participant since 2009. Now you, the viewers, are encouraged to engage with our speakers here tonight, and we ask you to type your questions into the Q&A tab at the bottom of your phones, your tablets, or your screens, and later this evening, my colleague Inda Gagan from Chagas and Ballinay will put your questions to our panelists, so please type your questions into the Q&A tab at the bottom on your screens. As always, this webinar has been recorded, and will be available to watch back on the Chagas Mayo YouTube channel in the coming days. So without further delay, I'll now hand it over to you, Seamus and Joe, to start sharing your presentation with us. Uh, so indeed, you know, keep your questions coming in, and we have a lot of farmers on, on this evening. So it's over to you now, Seamus. Okay, so thank you, first of all, uh, Brendan and your colleagues in Chagas for organising this webinar. I think it's very useful to to have a webinar and give the opportunity for us to outline what organic farming is, uh, what the organic farming scheme is, and uh, the opportunity to take questions. So, uh, what just, one, I'm, just one second there, Joe, can we make that a little bit bigger in presenter mode if that's possible? Yeah, if you just go to the slide show, that's it, that's fine there. Yeah, thank so, you very much. Now, yeah, so we'll move on to the uh, next slide there, Joe. So, I'm going to Fairly briefly, just um, I have two aspects that I'd like to discuss. One is an over overview of the organic sector. And secondly, um, is the scheme, the organic farm scheme. So it's no harm to just give an overview of the organic sector. Um, so we have 90,000 hectares under organic production. Uh, we have 2,350 organic operators, of which close to 2,000 are farmers. Um, and the other um, uh, 400 odd are um, processors, retailers, importers, and, and wholesalers. So there's close to 2,000 farmers. And of the farmers, there's uh, over 1,700 in, in the scheme. Um, and the scheme opened in, um, in 2021. Um, in 2020, we had uh, 74,000 hectares. We took in 300 uh, applications. There were 300 successful applications. All who applied got in. And uh, that increased the area from 74,000 to, to 90,000 hectares. And you'll see there, of, of that organic land, there's 90% of it is, uh, is converted land, maintenance, we call it, and 10% is in conversion. Okay, so we'll go to the next slide there, please, Joe. Okay, so the current situation, 90,000 hectares, as I say, uh, in organic produ production currently. So that's 2% of the agricultural area. Um, and we compare, um, I suppose we're low compared to other Euro uh, European states. Um, the likes of uh, Sweden, Austria um, have over 20%. As I say, we're 2% and the lowest is Malta. Malta comes in at under 1%. Under 1%. I just looked at some figures actually for Mayo. We have 52 certified organic uh, farmers in Mayo, um, farming about uh, 2,000, 2,500, 2, 2, a little over 2,500 hectares. And that's about 1% of the agricultural land in, uh, in Mayo. Okay. Um, and there you see the enterprises that are on, on these farms. Most uh, farms have more than one enterprise, as you'd expect. Cattle is the main enterprise. Uh, followed by sheep, and then the sectors that are really in demand is horticulture, grain, uh, poultry, and dairy. Uh, most of our organic fruit and vegetable is imported. There's a big demand there for that. Likewise, for uh, organic grain, a uh, big demand for our organic oats currently. 
and dairy is a very small sector with uh, a little over 60 uh, dairy herds. Um, so the main enterprises are sheep and uh, and and cattle. Uh, but the market, you know, there is a bit of a be it a, a rumor going out that the, there's no other market for organic beef and and lamb. Uh, Irish country meats are saying they're giving a 15% uh, premium for lamb, and um, uh, good herdsmen uh, they're talking about paying 560 per kilo in April for organic beef. So. I think that that's an indication as to what we're we're at. In terms of cattle, there um, we have about sixty thousand organic cattle on those farms. Um, so, and that's what less than one percent of uh, of cattle of all cattle on, on on all farms. And again, that would compare very low to, uh, compared to other member states across Europe. It's it's about eight percent organic cattle on uh, on um, on farms. So. Okay, so that gives uh, an overview. So I'll move on to the, sp the support that's been provided um, by DAFM. So it's the OFS, which we're talking about now. Uh, it's August, the Organic um, uh, Capital Investment Grant Scheme under TAMS 2. And uh, then we have OPIC, which is for processors, whereby we uh, provide good support uh, for processors, uh, for processing, obviously, organic uh, produce. So we'll go on to the next slide. So TAMS or AUKUS, it's a measure under TAMS 2, and there's grant aid available um, at 40% uh, as a standard rate, up to a maximum of uh, 80K. And for young farmers, that's paid at 60%. At 60%. And they're the current rates that are applying for 2022 in the CAP strategic plan, which has been uh, sent to, to Brussels, to the, to the commission for the new RDP Rural Development Programme, which starts in 2023. We've uh, submitted that the standard rate should increase from 40% to 50%. Now that hasn't been confirmed by the uh, by the commission, but uh, just to put it out there, that's uh, what is being proposed. And that, if that is successful, that will apply from 2023 till uh, 2027. And the, the, there's a big uh, menu of investments there that are, are eligible for grant aid under AUKUS. And you can get the terms and conditions there, be it on the, the department website or from Chagask. Next slide. Um, and looking further, further on, as I mentioned, the new RDP, the new cap, which comes into play in 2023, runs to 2027. And we have a target here of 7.5% of agricultural lands under organics by 2027, which is a fairly ambitious uh, target. Um, that equates to 335,000 hectares. Um, so to achieve that, we need to be bringing in 40,000 hectares per year, every year from 2022 to 2027. So it is ambitious. And that's reflected in the budget. There's a budget there under the new RDP of 256 million. Okay, and that's five times the budget that's in the current RDP from 2014 that's run uh, to the end of 2022. So we're back now to talk about, uh, I suppose, wh what's happening here uh, for 2022. Uh, there's a budget of 21 million allocated, and that's an increase of 5 million on 2021. And we just estimate that that 5 million will be sufficient to bring in maybe five, 600 uh, applications. And in the context of we brought in 300 applications in in, um, in uh, 2021, we we feel that there's sufficient funding there for all applicants to be successful. So the changes, some changes to the OFS in 2022 compared to 2021, there is an amended ranking and selection scheme. I'll talk about that in a second. What is important is the is the stocking rate. There's a reduction in the stocking rate, uh, the minimum stocking rate from 0.5 of a livestock unit per hectare to 0.15 of a livestock unit per hectare. So that's a reduction from the equivalent of a, a half suckler cow per hectare to one yo per hectare. And that's a very uh, extensive uh, stocking rate. And by making that change, that, will, that brings in um, about 1 million extra hectares um, 
um, which w can be considered uh, for for organics. So it brings in a, an extra uh, one million, which is which is very significant. Uh, I suppose the other point here is the ceiling for the for the higher rate of payment has been increased from sixty hectares to seventy hectares, and that reflects the uh, the growing farm size. So in terms of what you have to do to be eligible, you have to be an active farmer. You have to be to register with and be approved by an organic control body. And there's two OCDs, um, IOA and OT, and um, I'll show the, uh, the contact details for them a little uh, further on. You have to register with us, with the uh, organic division. Uh, we're based in Johnstown Castle in Wexford. Uh, you must hold an organic license at the date of submission of the application. All the lands must be declared in your name on the BPS. Uh, you must complete the um, FETAC level five, which is a, a 25 hour course. Um, and the certificate has to be uploaded by, on, by the 1st of November uh, of this year. And Chagas got run a number of these courses. Uh, Joe, who's uh, here tonight, uh, and uh, his colleague Elaine Levy uh, are running a number of these courses. And the courses are also being run by, uh, by NOTS. Uh, the minimum area is three hectares for agriculture and one hectare for horticulture. And you, you must achieve a minimum of 25 marks, but look at um, that, that should be no issue anyway. So in the very unlikely event that, um, that the funding is not sufficient to take in all applications, which is very unlikely, prioritization under the ranking and selection system uh, is given to young farmers. It's given to, to the sectors in demand, which is horticulture, grain, and dairy. It's given to total uh, conversion over partial conversion. Uh, it's given to mixed farms uh, to larger organic uh, areas and um, to the stocking rate, so uh, above 0.35 of a, of a stocking rate. So I suppose the, the important um, I, uh, subject here is the money and uh, the current rates running for 2022. First of all, for horticulture, um, for in conversion, it's uh, 300 euro per hectare up to six hectares and you need a minimum of one hectare and for full organic status or maintenance it's uh, 200 euro per hectare and there's a lower rate then uh, above the six hectares. For tillage it's 260 uh, for in conversion and 170 uh, for maintenance and for the tillage payment you need a, a minimum of uh, six hectares and above uh, 20 hectares there's a lower rate. And for, for all the others then, uh, which is grassland, I suppose, you know, we're talking about um, yeah, the livestock sectors here. Uh, so in conversion, it's 220 per hectare and it's once uh, for in conversion and it's, it's 170 for, uh, for maintenance. Uh, so for 70 hectares, to put it in context, for someone that's coming in maybe with a maximum of say 70 hectares, um, under these payment rates, uh, you're looking at a 15K payment for in conversion, and then for full organic status for the maintenance stage, uh, it's coming in around 12,000, a little under 12,000. So it's a very attractive payment, like the maximum the gloss payment is uh, is running at 5,000. So in that context, it's a, an attractive payment. There's also an additional red clover, it's an optional payment of uh, 30 euros per hectare up to 10 hectares. So some important dates, um, the scheme opened on the 9th of February. It closes uh, on the 8th of April. So there's a number of weeks there for people to consider uh, if they're if they're wanting to make an application. Uh, and an important date here is the BPS closing date. That's the 16th of May. So it's an online ap application process uh, through Ag Food. A lot of farmers will uh, avail of their Chagask advisor or consultant or, or planner, but it's optional. And I mentioned the organic control bodies. These are the contact details for the organic control bodies. There's two relevant here for what we're talking here uh, tonight, which is IOA based in Athlone and Organic Trust based in NACE. So they deal with farms. Uh, 
the the uh, the uh, third one is a global trust certification, and that deals with a aquaculture. So that's not relevant, obviously, for uh, for the farmer scenario. So the approval process is uh, the BPS closing date is the 16th of May. Uh, the ranking and selection uh, and selection uh, will commence once the BPS is finalised. OFS approvals will issue in September, and the advance payment it will uh, take place in November. So the final slide I have is the contact details. Uh, feel free to make contact with us. You know, if there's any questions, just feel free. That's the, our phone number. Uh, that's the email address. That's the uh, the website. Um, so uh, for any queries, feel free to make contact or obviously contact your Chagask advisor. And we'll take any questions here tonight. So thank you. Thank you very much, Seamus. That's a brilliant presentation. And we'll give you a few moments there to, to catch your breath. So, uh, and we'll come back to you again at, at the end for some questions and answers. So at this stage of the evening now, I'm just going to uh, ask Joe Kelleher there, who is the Chagas Organic uh, Specialist there to um, start sharing your presentation, Joe. And indeed, uh, Joe was based in the Chagas office in Newcastle West. And Joe uh, has some information there that if you are considering changing over to organic farming uh, this year or in the years ahead. So it's over to you uh, now, Joe. Thanks, Brendan. Uh, so, yeah, I'm just going to consider the thought process, maybe what people have to go through uh, if they're considering is organic an option for their farm. And I suppose tonight's presentation, I focus very much so on the dry stock, the, the beef and the sheep farmers. Uh, so I put a kind of an emphasis on those two sectors in particular. So I suppose the first thing um, that's often asked is, is, is stocking rate. And it it's very much... Um, you have to figure out why, where does your farm fit in? So you can have a number of scenarios when it comes to, to stocking rate. So if we look at this, we have a dairy cow and probably the best soil you can have in the country, a free drain and brown earth soil. And I know there's maybe a lot of people looking at saying they wish they had it, but if you do, just, uh, you're in luck. Uh, and in that situation, you can probably stock near to the maximum allowed in organics, which is two livestock units per hectare. Uh, it's the type of ground you can grow pretty much anything you want. You can grow tillage crops, you can put in red clover silages, you can put in multi-species like you see in that picture there. Um, and it allows you to do a lot of things and allows you to carry a, probably a higher stock rate. But I suppose what maybe is more typical might be something like this where we have a heavy clay soil in a heavy rainfall area um, and a bit of rushes interspersed in between it. And in that situation, then we really wouldn't be recommended that you'd be receding the likes of that ground. You'd, you'd probably stock it and match it to what the farm can naturally uh, grow. Um, so in that case, you're probably near to one livestock unit per hectare. Those pastures that you see in that are, can be very diverse species and very species rich. And we want to maintain them. So we don't really want to be ripping those up and trying to put clover and, and things into that. Yes, where we want to see the clover going is into these replacing fields that are ryegrass monocultures that maybe have been put in over the last 10 or 20 years. They're the ones we're targeting to put the clover into the multi-species, the red clover into those ones. But the picture you see here in the middle, uh, we'd be saying you leave that as it is and you match your stocking rate to it, which should be give or take, uh, depending on, you might have more rush content than what's on that picture, you might have less. Uh, so if it's if it's more rushes you have, you'll be going lower than one livestock unit per hectare. If, you have, if yours is a bit better than that, you might push it to 1.1, 1.2. The third picture then is, is probably common enough to you as well. It's a, the hill sheep farmer. Um, and in this case, you're probably stocking this at the lower uh, limit in organics, which is the minimum stocking rate, as, as was pointed out by Seamus earlier, during the 0.15 livestock unit per hectare. So that's the same stocking rate that get, qualifies you for the disadvantaged dairy payment. Uh, it's a yo to the hectare. Uh, and that, that is the appropriate stocking rate for that. And in some cases uh, where you're out wintering the yos on the hill, even I know in some cases that can actually be it'd be challenging enough to maintain that stocking rate. Um, so it's a case of, of figuring out where where do you fit in between those three pitchers and uh, pitching your stocking rate to, to the right spot. So it isn't that we can say it's a one size fits all. It's not. It's very much a farm specific. So if we look at cattle systems then, and what are the key considerations? So I have three questions here possibly that you should ask yourself. So is your current stocking rate below two livestock units per hectare? Um, as I said, showed there in the previous picture, you, you're not, that's the maximum stocking rate in organics. And to survive without fertilizer, uh, you, you're going to have to be well below two livestock units per hectare. Um, can you modify your sheds? And I'm going to go into this in a bit more detail to incorporate a, a bedded line area. One of the key rules of organics is that 50% of the floor area has to be solid floor area and has to be 
embedded with suitable material. So typically that's a straw bedded uh, area at the back of the slatted uh, feeding area. And I, again, I have pictures there later on to show that in a bit more detail. And the, the other question, which I think is, is, is very relevant in the way the fertilizer prices are going at the moment, but do you already use little or no uh, levels of artificial fertilizer? And if you're the farmer that typically buys a pallet or two of fertilizer for the silage ground, you have to ask yourself, if I was to get rid of that pallet or two, what, what would I have to change to my system to make it work in organics? Um, if you have the type of ground that can grow a bit of right clover to grow your silage, that'd be great. Can we use the slurry a bit better maybe to try grow a bit more silage or a bit more grass? And maybe can we cut back a bit on stock numbers? Uh, grow? We know we're going to grow a bit less grass maybe for the first year or two in particular. And can we match our cattle numbers nearer to what the farm can actually grow? So there, there are three key questions for cattle farmers. If you're a sheep farmer, then you possibly need to be asking yourself similar questions. So are, are you spreading fertilizer? Like if you're like what we have here in this top right corner, like you're, you're not going to be spreading fertilizer on that. So and what we find with a lot of sheep farmers, especially hill sheep farmers, is there's no fertilizer being spread. So a lot of these sheep on these hill sheep are, are organic in everything but name. Do you know, they, they're being farmed. There's no fertilizer, very little meal field going on. So it, it's, a, it's a minor tweak to the system uh, to convert some of these farms into organics. Uh, outwintering a sheep is allowed. So if you outwinter, that's fine. There's no issue with that in organics. It's just the nitrate rules that that, that applies. It's the same with cattle. You can outwinter a, a cattle as well. Uh, again, just as long as you're not poaching and you have low stocking rates and you've land suitable for doing it too. And do you have access to straw bedded sheds like you see in the picture there? So the rule for sheep housing is the same as cattle housing. 50% of the floor area has to be a solid floor area um, uh, as bedded with a suit of material, which is straw in, in that picture there. And then the next question I suppose you need to ask is can you avail of the full payment by meeting the minimum stocking rate so the minimum stocking rate is 0.15 and I'm aware that that can be challenging even to meet that for some farmers and I'm going to do an example there in a minute just to show uh, the impact of that so there, there are three key questions for, for hill sheep farmers uh, to ask themselves so Seamus mentioned rule changes there, and there was two rule changes. Uh, one was that the stocking rate went from a half a livestock unit down to 0.15, and the other one was that the maximum payment area went from 60 hectares up to 70. So if we look at a farmer that had 70 yos and 70 hectares under the old scheme, so what that farmer would have got, 60 hectares was the maximum payment. So they got paid in conversion, they got 220 per hectare uh, on 60 hectares, which is 13,200, which sounds great. But the minimum stocking rate under the old scheme was 0.5. And this farmer up here, he's 70 yos on 70 hectares, which equals 0.15. A yo is 0.15, so it's 0.15 livestock unit per hectare. So that farmer only had 30% of this minimum. So what that farmer got is they got 30% of this figure. So they got just shy of 4,000 euros under the old scheme. So um, it wasn't very attractive to hill cheap farmers. But what the, rule, the new rule change has done, and Shams touched on this, under the new scheme, you're now getting paid on 70 hectares instead of 60. Just the 220 is the same. So now the maximum payment is 15,400. The minimum stocking rate has been dropped to 0.15. So that same farmer is now meeting the, that payment. The pro rata payment is gone and that farmer will receive 15,400. So it's almost a quadrupling of payment. I'll be no, except that I'm, I'm probably using the most extreme uh, situation. Um, but it just highlights that there is a category farmer out there that can really benefit from these rule changes out there. Um, and as I say, most of them are actually, most of your farming very close to organic anyway, and it's only a tweak to the system uh, to, to change it to an organic system. So if we go back to the cattle then for, for a minute and we look at this situation here. So this, this is a, a farmer in, in Galway. Um, was out there about two weeks ago and this was his shed. And he, he shed there, if you can make out this pillar here at the back where my, the arrow is, that was the back wall of his shed uh, before he went into organics. So he didn't have the 50% bedded area there. So he had to add about six feet onto the shed here to make it suitable. So, you know, it, it wasn't a massively, it did cost him money, but it wasn't a massively expensive job. I think there's a perception out there that we have to build these massive straw bedded areas into the back of slatted sheds, but it doesn't have to be anything too elaborate. You know, something like that there will, will get you across the line. And what, what happens here in this situation, actually, is this gate is, is up against the wall here. So when he's cleaning out his straw bedded area, he actually pulls this gate out and it latches onto the pillar over here. He can keep his, his bullocks out here and he can clean out his shed from the side of the shed over. Uh, so it's a nice efficient system and a nice tidy setup uh, that didn't exactly cost him a, a fortune. One of the key things then, as we said, is the, the amount of space. There's a, there's a set amount of space required for every animal in organics. Um, so if we look at cattle, this is the table and these are the figures. So if you just take this figure here 
uh, the one meter squared per hundred kilo. Um, I know it might not tie in exactly up here, but it's a great rule of thumb if you use that. So if you have a 500 kilo bullock, that uh, bullock needs five meters squared of space in the, the shed. Now, of that five meters squared, then half of that can be slatted and the other half has to be solid floor area. So I think sometimes people think these figures here all have to be straw bedded. They're not. They're the total space within the shed that the animal has to have of which half has to be straw bedded. So if we put it into practice here and go back to that picture that we had. So let's assume that this shed is eight meters deep. So we'd say that's a four meter slat and that's a four meter uh, straw bedded area. And we'd say the bay which is, is five meters just to round off our figures. So that gives us 40 meters squared of a pin size. And if these bullocks are 500 uh, kilos in weight, it means we can put eight of them into that pin. Um, and that would seem to me to be about right. So, you know, it's, 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 it's what I would say is not a very major adjustment to the shed. Yes, it's going to cost a few quid to change it, uh, but still you will carry a, a decent enough number of cattle in a shed like that. So it's, it's changes like that that you have to try to get your head around. The, what do I actually have to do to my sheds to make them compliant with the organic scheme? The other big uh, issue that comes up, and I suppose there's a lot of misconceptions out there. I think people think that once you go into organic, you can't use any doses, you can't use any veterinary products whatsoever, and, and uh, you couldn't be further from the truth in reality. The re one of the core principles of organics is that animals cannot be allowed to suffer. So if an animal needs a certain uh, dose or a certain antibiotic to treat whatever is wrong with them, they get that uh, treatment. What happened, where the big difference is, is what happens before and afterwards. So the before is that the vet has to pretty much sign off on everything that the animal gets. Um, so you have a health plan, which you have to follow. And you, at the, when you sign up for organics, you fill out this health plan with your vet and you put, you list all the products you think you might need. Um, and then uh, that's signed off. I suppose the other difference is what happens after you use the product. So to, the, the easiest way to put it, and there are some caveats to this, especially with poultry production, is that the withdrawal period has to be twice what's on the bottle. So if the bottle of stuff that you're using says 28 days, you're going to have to not send that animal to the factory for 56 days because you're doubling the withdrawal period. So that's that's the most basic rule when it comes to veterinary, is all withdrawal periods are, are at least doubled. So then the other rule is the amount of antibiotics they can get over a 12 month period. So if we look at these bullet points here, so the first one is animals for meat consumption can get one course of antibiotics within 12 months. Now a course of anti antibiotics is if the vet gives you a bottle of pen strip and says you can use 20, you have to give that animal 20 cc's of pen strip for five days running, that's a course of antibiotics. Um, so it's not just the, the dose they get in one day. Um, if you have animals for breeding, so your suckler cows or your yews, they can get two courses of antibiotics within 12 months. If you have dairy cows, they can get two courses of antibiotics for mastitis within 12 months. And I suppose this is the rule then that if those uh, limits up here are exceeded, that animal loses its organic status. And I suppose what happens then is you have two options. One, either that animal packs its bags and leaves the farm or two, you, the, those animals undergo a further 15 month conversion period uh, before they can be considered organic again. So I suppose it's just, you can use most of the products that you are using uh, in conventional farming in organics. It's just, there's a bit more restrictions around the withdrawal periods and the amount of treatments an animal can get. So the, the, one of the key things that everyone's going to make their decision based on is profitability. So there's a number of factors that are going to affect profitability. So land quality is one, obviously, if you're on the best of ground, like we showed in the first picture there, uh, you've lots of options open to you. You can look at dairy cows, you can look at tillage systems, you can look at growing all sorts of crops, um, and maybe a lot of options more open to you. But in saying that, if you are on heavier clay type soils or mountain type soils and you stock your farm appropriately, like we discussed in the first soil, it still can be an extremely profitable system. The second point I would make is that the management sometimes uh, there's a perception out there that organic farming is almost a step backwards. But the reality is that some of the, the best farmers out there are organic farmers and the level of management is actually increased. It's a lot harder to grow grass without fertilizer than it is to go down to the co-op and buy a pallet of fertilizer and grow it. So the, the skills and the management levels needed are, uh, are, are higher. And I think it should be viewed as almost a challenge by people to view. And that's the way a lot of people who go into organic view it, is they see it as a challenge to do this um, and it, it's a very rewarding way of farming is what I would say. The, the next one is the access to markets and I'll cover that a bit more in my next slide and Seamus touched on it earlier as well and then there's the scheme support which Seamus outlined. 
Um, like the scheme payments there can amount to a very good check. Like if you can get 15,000 euros, if you the maximum hectares, like it's, it's a decent number of money. It's hard to walk away from it. And if you throw in all the other schemes that are out there with the basic payments, the disadvantage, the eco schemes and so on, you know, your, your check in the post can be nice. And there's no need to apologize for having a good check in the post. Um, that's what they're there for. This is what the, the consumer wants. So this is why you're getting paid for it. And the attitude towards organic is key as well. If we, It's important that people go into the scheme and believe in the true ethos of organics and providing uh, higher quality food is, is really the, the, the main ethos behind it. So going back to the markets, I suppose, what are your options? So uh, in conventional farming, typically the main default option is the processor. Uh, and I suppose it's the same default option we have in organics as well. So if you're a, a dairy farmer, you have five co-ops to pick from. If you're a beef farmer, we have two main beef processors in the country. You've Good Herdsman in Care and Tipperary, and you've Slaney Meath uh, in Wexford. And I know some of them uh, have collection points up and down the West Coast. Um, you for lamb then you've Irish country meats below in Wexford and uh, key packing Kilbegan and Westmead are also taken in a few of late as well uh, so they're, they're, they're the main processing options uh, typically your payment rates are going to be somewhere between 10 and 20% of a premium above conventional prices. Um, so it, it look, as they said, at beef price at the moment, 560. Um, uh, I know conventional prices are hitting towards a five, but I suppose your, your average animal is 470, 480. Where, so if you can get 560, you know, it is it does work out about a 15% premium. Um, the other option is direct sales. So we see this a lot in the horticulture uh, sectors in particular, um, where you can actually get more than a 100% premium on your, your projects by selling direct to the consumer. And there's huge demand for that. Um, there's lots of people doing selling beef, the beef in the box, the sheep in the box, direct to the consumer, and they're becoming more and more popular. Um, and there seems to be a huge appetite out there for consumers for that type of product. So um, milk vending machines are another one that are popping up all over the place. So there, there are options and if, if you do sell direct to the customer you really can extract a huge amount of the 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 in value of the product for yourself selling to other farmers is a big option but i suppose that's really um you have two scenarios really where it comes in is one is the suckler well there's a couple of scenarios one is the suckler farmer who uh, ideally would sell his weanlands to a finishing unit and it's important in that's in a scenario for both farmers that if a relationship can be built up where uh, you go back to the same people year on year and we do see that happening a lot you we need to develop the same kind of a system for the hill cheap farmer where we can get the specialized finishing units uh, maybe in the middle and an east on ideally probably tillage type farms uh, where the, the the mountain the lambs from the mountain yews can be taken onto specialized finishing and they're kept within the organic system unfortunately a lot of lamb in particular is falling out of the system and it's probably down to just that breakage or that linkage and that's just the body of work that needs to be done uh, by all of us involved in the organic sector uh, and the other one is, is tillage farmers selling grain to livestock farmers as well is another great outlet for, for selling direct to farmers there's huge opportunity there for farm related groups um the best example we have in the country at the moment is the little milk company where 13 farmers came together a number of years ago formed their own co-op um, and now they're processing their milk into cheese and that cheese is being exported to france germany and america and is huge uh, seller and they're actively looking for another 10 or 20 suppliers on the back of that so it's a huge success story and i think that model can be replicated across other sectors as well if we could just get a group of like-minded individuals to come together so I suppose the, the, the main message I would say is, is if you're thinking of converting is to find out as much information as you can. So the farm walks and we have a series of 12 of them happening. The first one happened today, Blow and Clare, uh, and there's, there's 11 more of them happening between here and July. So try to get to them. They're a great way of getting information. You'll get to meet a lot of like-minded farmers. You'll get to hear from the farmer and the host farmer and so on, uh, and a great way of getting information. Uh, and talk to other organic farmers. If there's anyone in your area that you know, talk to them. They're a very generous bunch with their time organic farmers and they love helping other people that are genuinely thinking of it so it I would say just just try to get as much information as you as you can. I've just two final slides here. Shem has touched on this. This is a, a kind of a snapshot of what's happening in Europe. And the green in the middle is the European average here, which is about eight and a half percent. And as Shem has said, we're second in the league table. We'd be in relegation battle here. Um, Malta are just below us. Uh, we're on two percent. So there's huge scope for improvement. 
And what's happening in a lot of these countries here is they're actually peaking out now. Maybe it, they've, there's only probably so many farmers you can convert in some of these countries uh, and they're finding it hard. And now what's happening is the demand. And if we look at this graph, this top line here is the consumer demand in Europe for the last 20 years. So from 2000 to 2020. And if you see here, so the demand for the consumer has gone up by 700%. So the European co consumer is demanding more and more organic produce in their basket every year. Uh, and it's increasing at a very steady rate. The bottom line is the amount of land that's been converted to organic. So you could say here that the amount of demand is going up nearly double the rate of the, the supply. So what's happening is the big European um, consumer countries, which is the French, the Germans, the Dutch, uh, they now cannot meet their own demand from their own domestic supply. So they're now looking uh, for imports to meet that demand. And I think we're ideally positioned to capture some of that. Uh, we've one of the best climates for organic farming. We can grow the stuff behind my back there is 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 absolutely so natural for this country. Um, it's capable, that stuff behind my back there in the picture is capable of growing, uh, fixing 200 kilos of organic nitrogen and the price of nitrogen, and um, we can get it for free. So we should really be, be looking to capitalize on that. There are the series of walks that are coming up uh, across the year. Uh, if you just put Chagos Organic Events into Google, it will take you to the whole host of, of what's happening in webinars and farm walks uh, for the next uh, few months. So, Brendan, that's me done. Thank you very much, Joe. There's some great, uh, some great figures there and statistics there. Um, and certainly, I'm sure, um, food for thought there for people watching tonight. And we have a lot of farmers on tonight. And I think, look at one of the things we've been doing over the last number of weeks, we've been running an interactive poll um, with, with our viewers. So just tonight, just to uh, conclude with our series, we're going to just run a quick, short poll. We've got one question. Um, we've given you two very good presentations. So we're just going to ask you one question. Um, and it was the question really is, um, will you consider joining the organic farming scheme in 2022? And we have four options there for you. Uh, you know, the first option there will be, yes, I will join in 2022. Uh, the second option is I will join in 2023 or in the years ahead. So you might join, you're not, maybe you're just ready to join yet. Um, the third option there you have is I'm still undecided about organics. And the fourth option there um, is that I will remain an organic or, sorry, I will remain uh, conventionally farming in the years ahead. So we leave the poll running and uh, we have nearly 100 farmers on tonight. So uh, we leave the poll running for a few minutes and we will come back to the poll uh, at the end to gauge the views of our viewers tonight. And um, it'll something be, uh, you know, of interest there, um, you know, for, for, for future years ahead. So look at um, at this stage, I'm now going to uh, call on uh, my colleague, John Noonan to start sharing his, uh, to turning on his camera. And indeed, our other guest speaker this evening is Joe Kelly, who is an organic farmer uh, based in in, um, in Bala County Mayo. So Joe Kelleher, will give you a short break for the moment and we'll come back to you again after the questions and answers um, section. So um, I'm just going to just call on Joe Kelly just to, to start his video and indeed John Noonan as well, just to, just to come in here. And both John and Joe are going to have a short a uh, little interactive uh, conversation this evening uh, on Joe's system and indeed how Joe has managed being an organic farmer since 2009. So John and Joe, it's over to you. And indeed, look at you, the viewers at home, um, there's still there'll be questions and answers after both John and Joe. So they have about um, maybe seven or eight minutes maybe you know, to go through a number of questions. So over to you now, John. Hey, thanks, Brendan. Uh, Joe, how are things? Not so bad, John, how are you keeping? Mighty now, mighty. Yeah, so uh, it's great to have you on the on the the webinar tonight, Joe. And um, I know you're passionate about organic farming, and and that's the reason I asked you to come on, I suppose. And I suppose my first question, and I'm sure all the the the, the viewers tonight are wondering, why did you why did you start organic farming in 2009, and what was it that that, that got you to make the change? We'll call it. I'd been uh, rearing pigs for years and years before that probably over 25 years in pigs, intensively farming pigs. And probably for the last 10 years that I was in pigs, maybe between 98 and 2008, I would have loved to have gone organic. My instinct was probably a fairly green issue that I was interested in the planet. I want to leave the planet as good or better than I found it. Uh, I thought intensively farming pigs, apart from the fact that it was 
the, everything was getting bigger and bigger numbers and everything like that. It was completely against what I believed in, but it was very hard to get out of it because of debt and, and, and being committed to buildings and all sorts of stuff. But anyway, uh, so I finally decided get out of pigs altogether, 2008. And I went in into the organics in 2009 because I basically I wanted to increase and improve the microbiology in my in the soils of my farm. Mm. And I've been given to me by my father. And I thought, let's leave this land is better than I got it. Okay, good man. Yeah, mighty stuff. Um, I suppose you have a number of systems on your farm. You have sucklers and you have horticulture. Um you might just chat a little bit about the sucklers and then a little bit mm. about the horticulture and what do you keep? It's suckler cows you have, isn't it? Many suckler keep? cows, yeah. I'd have yeah. usually 17 or 18. That's what I'm running it now, roughly. Yeah. And, and um, what breeds are they? Continental. Nearly all the cows are... are uh, I have very little Charlie in them. I have a bit of short Harden, Belgian Blue, Limousine, and a little bit of Simmental. Hmm. But I had a Belgian blue bull for a few years and I had a couple of short hardened cows and I crashed. I found the Belgian blue short hardened cross, a great cross. And it bred a good shaped animal and a good colour. And um, I found it very difficult actually to change from the continental bull with those cows because I, mm. I was so used to producing shapey calves and mm. being proud of the calves and the Wainlands. And so that was it. That, was, that took me. So did you, did you change then? Did you keep using the continental bull or did you, did you switch to something else? I, I finally switched to the to the, uh, to the Aberdeen Angus Bull. Um, it took me probably eight, seven, seven years maybe. I just couldn't make the change. It was like, how can you put an, an Angus Bull up in these continental cows that I had bred for 30 years, yeah. kept breeding daughters of mothers of daughters of mothers, and yeah. I was so happy with the cows, and I knew the cows. And uh, But a couple of things that became apparent to me, one of them was, you know, when you have good continental cows and you put a good Angus bull up on them, you won't lose the calf, won't turn into a three cornered calf straight away because you have the continental breed in the mother's side. Mm. And I bought a good Angus bull actually as well. So I had a good long Angus bull and the, the wind is quite very shapely and they're ready to kill quicker. They're like 24 months, mm. 26 months. Calves are, are nearly fit for slaughter. And because organic feed is dearer than conventional feed, trying to feed as much off grass as you can makes more sense. Absolutely, yeah. And you're also in the beep scheme, aren't you? Yeah, you, you, part That's of that. right. So, so I use a bit of uh, before the calves are weaned, I put them on a bit of feed, and I keep feeding them on afterwards. And I sell the weanlands. That's the stage I sell my cattle at is the weanlands. So you have a good hairy calf in, in nice shape, and like. A couple of months have to been weaned. He's a he's a great product for a, a man to take on and and uh, work with. So it's so be kind of it, it'd be early spring. You'd be selling the weanlands, yeah. It could be late winter, early spring. spring yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, what about the horticulture then? What's how how is that going for you? The horticulture is the thing that my father was in growing raspberries. Went into raspberry growing after the war, actually, 1948. And uh, Lord rest my father, he, he, he died in, in 87. And I, I, I switched that time into sheep for a few years. And I had more cows at the time. I was a conventional farmer because I was in the pigs as well at the time. So I had a good bit of slurry. So I was spreading mm. lots of the P and K levels were high in the land. Mm. And uh, when I was coming to thinking about the organic thing, about 2004, 2005, I started to get a bit concerned about, you know, what kind of food I was eating. I had uh, a young child at the time and having a second child. And I was thinking, what do I want to feed my children? So I started growing a small bit of vegetables in a little tunnel. And um, th that developed. Then when I went organic in 2009, I put up another tunnel or two. And then I started to grow a bit of stuff outside. Then I found that that fit quite nicely with the beef enterprise that I had. Mm, because you, I could had, use the, you could use the farm yard manure and that sort of exactly. thing. Exactly. Yeah. So mm. what I did was I cleared another yard and I, I stored the bales, and now I needed less bales because I reduced my stocking rate, and I needed less bales. So I used a silage slab, which I had a new silage slab in 2009 I put up along with the bit of work I did on the sheds. And there was grants that, that time in 2009. And I started to put the muck out of the shed onto the slab, covering it, mm -hmm. and letting it rot. It rots like very well, like from if you clear out the shed like by early April, Yes. In the middle of April, by the end of August, the beginning of September, that stuff is in great shape. I see, I see. It rots down really well, especially with straw 
and 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 Comuk. We might come back to that in a minute because mm. we're going to talk a little bit about soil fertility. Um, I suppose a question that a lot of people that might be listening that are conventional at the minute and they're 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 thinking about the organics is how did you adjust to the scheme when you went in? Like Joe was on there that, you know, the certain uh, guidelines, you can't use fertilizer, you can't put out chemical sprays, you know, mm-hmm. you won't be buying as much feed because it's more expensive. How did you adjust? Well, th- that's an advantage. It's an even bigger advantage this year because when, when I took out the, 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 if you're using bank fertilizer and if you're going to reduce meal bills and reduce the fertilizer bill, Mm-hmm. Straight away, you, you have a few more quid in your pocket. Mm-hmm. You have your grant coming in. If you had forty, if you had forty hectares, if you could get forty hectares together, you had eight thousand odd, maybe a little under eight thousand in the in the hundred and seventy hectare scheme. Right. So I was looking around at me me farm, saying, "Where else can I get this amount of money? Mm-hmm. Where are you going to get eight thousand? And it's not easy, got and the the fact that. There's so much energy around producing stock and one thing or another. By reducing the stock and rate a bit, I know this is hard for farmers to do. It was hard for me to do. I had, mm. at one stage in the late 80s, I had 33 cows. And then it, when I was conventional, and, and then I was down to 25 cows. But by the time I went to this, I went down to 17 or 18. Now, I've lost a bit of land as well that I was renting before. So mm-hmm. I'm working off a bit less of a base than I was at 33. But not similar to what I was when I was 25. But what I found was, if cattle have a bit of grass under their head, they're happier. And let, let them let them graze. You don't have to graze it to the bone. Let them onto the next field. Make room. The big trick for me was the dock and the rush. But now to go a bit of pig story over the time, I had quite a bit of docks in a couple of the silage fields. And I had a few farmers saying to me, the Lord, save us, how can you look at them? Yeah. And I said, I don't look at them for too long because I try and get them fields ready for cutting by the first week of June before the dock is shut out. Yes. Put them young. And use the cattle slurry on those fields in early April. Cut that silage, get it into the pit. After that, the, the dock is not as, as bad. And you, and we mentioned before we came on about clover. Clover is a key thing for you, isn't it? it? Clover is key. You know, even if you have to stitch it, you don't have to plough land to set clover. Mm-hmm. You can find ways of putting clover into the into the lay. And, and a lot of lands, especially old lays, have clover in them already. So, so they'll come. So when when you cut come. the fertilizer, it'll come naturally. Was, come. We're going to mention briefly about markets and how do you market your mm. weanlands? Because we're going to we have to we have to leave some time for questions and answers. Then, so how but do you market your stock? Because that's something farmers going in is like, what do I, how do I how do I work with my weanlands and that sort of thing? There's marts available. Up to, uh, uh, there's no mart near me. The nearest mart to me is I think one or two, three or four sales maybe in Roscommon. Mm-hmm. I was up to a couple of the sales, but I I, I met a guy. That, that is maybe about 40 minutes away from me, that over the last few years was looking for Waynelands. He came down, had a look at me cows, had a look at me bull, and he said, we'll try it for a year. After a couple of years, we, 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 we've we did a number of years where he comes, buys the Waynelands, you can either sell them by weight or you can just sell them by eye. Mm. And we tried to set a price and we stuck to that over the time. Good man, good man. And it's worked I'd... out very well, that's worked out very well. Joe, we could be talking all night about this, but we just don't have the time, unfortunately. So we're going to have mm. some time now for questions and answers. So thank you, Joe, for coming on. You're, you. you're a mine of information and a lot of practical stuff there. I'll hand you back to Brendan. Thanks. Thank you um, very much, John. And, and indeed, look at uh, some great information. And Joe, look at, uh, you, you'll say with us, because I'm sure there's a lot of questions I see in, in the chat there. Um, at this stage of the evening, I'm just going to um, ask Seamus as well. Uh, Seamus there, who was with us earlier on, uh, maybe to come on as well. And indeed, Seamus can um, also be able to um, come on and then ask some of the some of the questions now as well. So um, at this stage, I'm now going to hand it over to Inda Gagan there to start uh, sharing your presentation with us, Inda. So um, it's over to you now, uh, Inda. Yeah, thanks very much, Brendan. Um, look, just to thank the lads there for very informative presentations. And it has certainly, we'll say, um, interested the, the viewers because there is loads of questions here coming in and uh, just to start off there was a, a nice easy question there maybe for for joe kelleher can i include commonage land in organics and if not do i have to keep my flock separate i.e commonage sheep and lowland sheep Say yes, no, and yes again to that one. So the 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 answer is uh, you can't, as the rules stand, you can't get paid on commonage land in organics. However, you can 
uh, if you have commonage land, you can join the organic farming scheme and you can graze your yews on it as long as they're at what's called a hefted flock, which your questioner, the person that asked the question, kind of alludes to. So a hefted flock basically means that they won't, you can guarantee that they don't mix with uh, another flock on the commonage. Um, and if you can guarantee that, you can continue to use the commonage, you can join the organic farming scheme and you can get paid on your privately owned land uh, in that. Um, that's that's the, the basic nub of it. That's grand, Joe. And um, for Seamus there, um, can you be in glass and in organics? Yes, you, you, you can indeed. Um, you now, glass is, is closed, um, but there are a lot of people in organics that are in glass. There are certain measures uh, that the organic farmer uh, can't uh, get, certain glass measures. They are laid out in Appendix 5 of the OFS Terms and Conditions. We'll have a new AECM coming in, which will be the new glass coming in in 2023. And we're looking to get as much synergy as possible between the OFS and the new AECM. That's the, uh, the new scheme. Um, uh, finally, uh, organic farmers will get priority access into the new organic scheme in 2023. Uh, okay, thank you. That's grand. Thank you, Seamus. Um, one for for Joe Kelleher there again. In organics, can you purchase bedding or wood or wood chip? And what are the conditions? I suppose with straw and that, do you have to buy it from an organic tillage producer? Or can you get conventional? Yeah. So when it comes to straw, um, you can you can you can buy conventional straw for bedding. Uh, so if you're feeding the straw, it has to be organic straw. But if you're bedding the animals with the straw, uh, you can buy it from conventional sources. Um, uh, rushes are equally permitted. You can build rushes and make bedding out of them. They're equally permitted. Um, the wood chip, Seamus? Yeah, wood chip. wood chip is OK. There's a, a document called uh, the organic, organic Standards. And for anyone that's looking for specifics and details, um, on any aspect of organic farmer, organic farming, uh, you can look at the organic standards. There's a new document that was uh, produced um, just at the start of this year. It's on the, the department website. And on that, you'll see that Woodchip is eligible. That's grand, Seamus. Thank you. Um, Joe, there again for you, the 50% floor area requirement. Can this be over several sheds or does each shed um, be treated separately. Uh, it can be over several sheds, uh, as like the the way the wording is in the standard the chairman's referred to there is that they have free access to the shed. So I suppose that's the key point is that they're the animals if they're, if they're going between two sheds. So let's say you have a a hay barn and it's there's ten yards between it and the slatted shed, that the cattle can access both both sheds freely. And if you can make up your square meters uh, between the two sheds combined, then there's no issue as long as the cattle have free access between those sheds. But I suppose the key, the key point is that every animal, so you take a suckler cow who needs six meters squared, that suckler cow has to have three meters squared to lie down on, and it can have three meters squared of slatted. So each animal has to have access to the lie down, I suppose, is the key. Okay. That's grand. Um... Are organic payments on top of standard payments? Maybe Seamus, you'd like to. Yeah, I assume, that, yeah. I assume by standard payments we're talking about BPS. That's payments. ANC and BPS. A, a, so. Exactly, ANC and uh, BPS. And the answer is yes, they're on top. That's grand. Um, Joe, again, the organic farmer said he's feeding his wainlands. Or this is for Joe Kelly. The organic farmer said he's, feed, he, he's feeding his wainlands. What did he feed them? So where do you get your feed, I suppose? You get your, getting your organic meal. Where do you get it, Joe Kelly? Yeah, it's organic feed. And uh, there's a few farmers producing feed. There's uh, a chap there in Cork that I was buying off a couple of years ago. The last year or two, maybe two years, I've been buying it through Arivo there in the local co-op. And you can get the ton bags or... Our, 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 our small bags, but the tongue bag suits me. Okay. And it's fairly easily sourced again, Joe. It, it has been uh, for me anyway. I've, uh, like a couple of tunnels do my 
lock away in the dryer because I'm once once I've them finished uh, once they're away I'm sorted. Perfect. Um, I suppose a question that that you often get asked to Kelleher is how do you control rushes in organics? Yeah, I suppose uh, the first thing is you're never going to eliminate them in organics and maybe you have to learn to live with a certain amount of them. Um, the tools that you have available to, to control them, I suppose, that rushes like two things, the, the like water and the like acid conditions. So if you can get rid of one of the two of them or ideally both of them, uh, you have you've a good chance of getting rid of the rushes. So obviously a bit of drainage might help to, to solve on the right type of soils, might help to solve one issue. Uh, spreading lime, is great way of getting rid of them. And then the last option you have is the topper. And most farmers in organic, the topper is 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 the, the main tool they have for controlling uh, not only rushes, but all weeds. And uh, could we bring in um, Joe Kelly on that one? Yeah. Just to... yeah, that was one of the things that was a, a difficult thing when I started first. What are you going to do with the rushes? And especially the neighbours saying, how the hell can you keep looking at rushes? But the trick is, and there's years that's more suitable than other years, but if you get two toppings on them, if you top them twice, it makes a great job of them. It takes the strength out of them. But um, you, you get used to some land. A lot of my land is damp and watery and wet. And rushes is the natural thing that grows on it. And and as long as the, the lime levels are good, and the you now some of them peaty grounds, is not too fond of lime. So they'll grow rushes, but in between the rushes, this good, nice bits of grass grows. The, the, the rushes is, in those kind of conditions are, is a great plant to, to get rid of some of the water. I'm not interested in spending a lot of money draining. Now the new thing is we're talking about keeping water in the land for boards and different things. Mm-hmm. So I want to work, I want to work with, the, with nature. And so that's my thing is, and, and often where there's bits of rushes and stumps of rushes, cows are putting out cows this day of the year, calves have a grand bit of shelter. So it's it's not what we're doing. Maybe it's not up in Mead or somewhere else, but it's it's what we some of the the kind of land I have in Mayo. Yep. Mm. Um, a quest. Thanks, Joe, for that. A question there for Seamus. Um, is leased land eligible under the organic scheme? It is indeed. Yeah, it's a five-year scheme, so a lease needs to be in place. Okay, so you're looking for a five-year lease. That's okay. And it's a five-year lease from the beginning of when you're admitted into the. So there has to be five full years. Five full years, yeah, yeah. yeah. Perfect. Sorry about that, Brendan. No problem. Um, how did Joe Kelly incorporate clover into his grassland? He said he didn't plough. So maybe Joe Kelly how, Question. how? Yeah. Yeah. There's there's a couple of ways I did it. Um, a couple of them I just give it a light rubber of a grubber over over some of the ground. And uh, we, we just sh- basically shook it in the ground in a, a kind of a drizzly damp kind of conditions. Um, I, on one occasion, I put uh, a couple of bags into when I was uh, putting out the slurry in April. I actually just put a couple of bags into the slurry tank, mixed it and spread the slurry. And it seemed to, there seemed to be quite, we just tickled the ground a little bit, spread the slurry on it. And there seemed to be quite a take in it actually. And it definitely helps when you cut the silage in in early June. If you could cut the silage in early June, and and if you have your slurry out early, cut the silage in early June. The the, the clover really comes then strong after that in the aftergrass. I had another farmer in the in in Wexford. Actually, was doing something similar. He was he was as he was spreading the slurry, he was putting a kilo of clover pellets into the spout of mm. the the tank. So when he put on his hose, then he was sucking one kilo into each tank. And if you were spreading the tank to the acre. You knew you were getting the kilo out, so it is it is a handy way of getting a, a bit of clover out. And just on that as well, um, the end of April, the end of April seems to be a good time to do it if you are going over sowing, gives the plant a chance to get to get a good head start and that sort of thing. So, yeah, definitely if you're if any if anyone's going doing it, end of April, beginning of May is a good time to to make a start on it. Exactly. Okay. And just a question there for Joe Kelleher, um, the P and K levels. For does the P and K levels need to be, we'll say, in index three for for some clover? Or did they need to be good? I think that is the, the question I saw. There's a red clover they're asking specifically. I think red clover, yeah. Yeah. So for red clover, red clover is very hungry on P and K, and it does like a, a nice whack of it. So um, ideally, uh, index two and upwards. Um, on index one, it it'll grow, but you mightn't have the same tonnage. 
Um, so the better the P index, the more of it that you'll, you'll grow and the more bales you'll get to the, ba- to the acre. But the key thing is that, that you put out either slurry of farm manure after because uh, whatever you have, um, you know, it just, it does, it, it's going to provide its own nitrogen. Does it, It'll have heaps of nitrogen, but it does like a bit of P and K. So you have to give it that either the slurry or the farm manure. So if you are cutting it three or four times in the year, it's it's kind of important that you'd leave a bit of slurry back in the tank uh, to have it to put on the right clover ground. Okay. And just another common question there, Joe, um, that, that we'd be asked, Joe Kelleher, is do I have to sell my existing herd before I go into organics? No, um, and it's a common question that is asked. Uh, in the, so if you go into organics, uh, you can bring your existing suckler herd, you can bring in your existing flock of yos into, they can come in, you go through your two-year conversion period, and what happens then is that if we take a herd of suckler cows, the calves that they have will become organic, the cows themselves will never become organic, and when it comes to those cows being culled, they're culled to the conventional factory, the conventional mart, uh, but their calves, once they do the two-year conversion, their calves are organic, and it's the same with, with yos it's the same with dairy cows it's the same once you do your two-year conversion the the, the milk or the progeny are will become organic okay and finally joe i'll just um give you this to, to wind up with who is the ideal farmer for organics in your opinion the ideal farm, I suppose, is someone that is is kind of, a, and Joe Kelly in fairness touched on it, is someone that's environmentally conscious and environmentally aware and has kind of demonstrated that over the last number of years. So they're, they're the farmer that has been sown a few trees in the corner of the fields, they're the farmer that has been dabbling with sown a bit of clover or multi-species, and they're very environmentally aware. They're not spreading an awful lot of fertilizer, they're not feeding an awful lot of meal, they're lowly stocked. And it's a very small tweak to the system is needed to, to convert them to organics. That, that to me is the ideal farmer. And there's lots of them out there. Okay. Um, just on that, there's a, a good few questions there coming in, Brendan, but we will endeavour yeah. to answer them all over the next um, yeah. day or two. And so you, might, you might share the poll into there as well, if you can, yeah. Yeah. And just maybe before um, I finish, before I bring up the poll there, Seamus just touched on it, the um, closing date for the BPS. The BPS is open at the moment. So um, for people just to come into the offices, we're back in the offices now. And thank God for the first time in two years nearly. So if people want to come in, make their appointments, um, there's lots of questions out there about um People have got new maps, so there is lots of questions out there. So people want to make their appointments early um, and just to keep the whole thing um, flowing along smoothly to avoid bottlenecks at the, in May. And that is the poll there, Brendan, if you want to read it out. Yeah, yeah, I, you'll have to read it out there, Andrew, because... Um, yeah, okay. Um, right. So the question was... Will you consider joining the organic farming scheme in 2022? Um, yes, I will join in 2022. 14% said they will join in 2022. Um, I will join in 2023 or in the years ahead. 10% answered um, positively to that, so that they will join in 2023. Um, I, I'm still undecided. You have a good big percentage there of 63% still undecided. And I will remain farming conventionally in the years ahead. You have 16% there. So as you can see there, there is um, a lot of interest in it. And I suppose there is still a lot of uh, uh, questions to be answered by these farmers. And that is demonstrated there by the 63% that is still undecided. But as a result of tonight's webinar, I hope that there is a bit more um, information and knowledge out there. Thank you very much, Inda, for that. And indeed, look at us, we're, we're just about out of time. We've gone over a little bit, but indeed, uh, I'd like to sincerely thank our three panellists tonight, uh, Joe Kelly, um, Joe Kelleher, 
and indeed uh, uh, Seamus Barden also from the Department of Agriculture. Uh, and indeed, look, at, we hope that you found this webinar ben beneficial. Um, indeed, this has uh, you know, been uh, the, the seventh night, our final episode in the Chagas Mayo Spring Webinar Series. We will be getting the recording uploaded to the Chagas Mayo YouTube channel in the coming days. I'd like to sincerely thank Inda tonight as well for hosting the questions and answers, and indeed Vivian there for the last number of weeks also for um, also for facilitating the questions and answers. Also, a number of staff here regionally have also helped out who would like to acknowledge their help in making this series a success. Uh, Bernadette Lynn, Louise O'Grady, Michelle Lavelle there in Chagas and Ballina, and Tara Guinan in the PR department in Chagas uh, for all their work over the last number of weeks. And indeed, as was most importantly, thanks to you, the listeners at home tonight, for engaging with us over the last number of weeks. We hope you found this series beneficial. And as Inda said, look at, uh, you know, making an appointment with your Chagas advisor or consultant as soon as possible if you need help with your basic payment scheme this year. So look at it's good night from us all here in County Mayo and indeed uh, stay safe folks. <laughs>